All right, we are in a series called Straight Talk on Important Issues. So last week we started that and we kind of hit really hard with marriage, divorce, remarriage, and eunuchs. Everything you wanted to know about eunuchs last week, right? So if you were here, that's kind of how that passage ends. And um, Jesus speaks straight. And um, parents, just a word to you. Some of you commented about, man, that was tough to hear with our kids. Um, so I'll apologize if that was more than um, they were ready for, but just a bit of a challenge as well. The place where children should hear about marriage and sex is in the church and the family, not in the schools. So don't trust the schools to teach them about sex and marriage and, that, and gender. It should happen here and by you in your homes, all right? So we pray for you. And, and again, um, don't trust, this is, I'm going to say it, don't trust social media, all right, for them to hear this right, or their peers, or our public school education. The public schools do a lot of great things, uh, but that's not their job. All right, so we need to own that. And interesting, after we talked about that in the text, here's what, what the text goes on to say. It says, then some children were brought to him. <laughs> so right after Jesus talks about marriage and remarriage and immorality and eunuchs, then all these children, they happen to be there, and he blesses them. And, and again, this is the place for children. It's where they should learn things that are true. Now, that means it's sometimes going to be a bit awkward, uh, it's sometimes going to be noisy and distracting, and that's all good, amen, because children are here, and Jesus loved the children, we love children, and it's all good. Uh, notice at the bottom of that text, it says he departed from there. That's Jesus. He left that area, and um, so we kind of know where he was. He left the Sea of Galilee, and he went down, that yellow line going down, and then he, he kind of we think he moved a little closer to Jerusalem because that's ultimately his end game, to be in Jerusalem, uh, to be crucified. Um, and on this journey from where he was, a young man comes up to talk with him. And it's a beautiful text we're going to talk about today. I hope we don't miss anything. It's one of those familiar texts which are really good because we know it, but then we miss things because, well, we know this story. So we're going to have the scripture read today. Denny's going to read it for us, and then he'll be leading us in prayer. And I'm going to ask you again to stand as we read scripture. You can follow along. It'll be up on the screens. You can open your Bibles. You can read out loud if you'd like to. But Denny, thank you. Okay, we've got a mic coming. All right. This is out of the New American Standard Version, and you might have something different. Thank you, brother. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of 
God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and Almighty God, I thank you this morning for this passage from the scriptures. Our Savior's very words, spoken 2,000 years ago and preserved for us. I ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher today, instructing us personally, making the words impact us as he sees fit. We open our hearts and minds to receive the message from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you, Denny. Appreciate that. So someone came up and asked a question. Who is this someone? I'm going to call him a great man. This is a great man because of what all the, this gospel and the other gospels say about him. We kind of sum it all up when we call him the what? The rich young ruler. Now it didn't say all of that in there, but when we go to the book of Luke, it says he was extremely rich. He had many possessions, and in this text, he had much property. Later in the book of Matthew, or in this text, it says he was a young man, probably under 40, not a teenager, but younger. And then Luke 18, or Luke, in the book of Luke, it says he was a ruler of some kind. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of ruler he was. The word actually means the first in rank of some kind. And you need to understand as we think of all, about, all of that, the culture that Jesus was speaking into was not a youth-orientated culture like ours is. It, was, it honored old age and respected old age. So for a young man to be a ruler in that culture would have been unique. It, it speaks a lot about this man. And, and I'm, I'm going to try to connect a few dots. I'm going to suggest that he was probably the synagogue ruler. That would have been not a priest, but a man that oversaw what happened in the synagogue, making sure everything was ready. It was a big responsibility in that day. So in the culture, I'm going to suggest this was a great man. He had achieved wealth, possessions, property. He had achieved status, and he had achieved it at a young age for that culture. Now, I want to contrast that because many of the people, as you read through the Gospels, that came to Jesus were not that. People came to Jesus who were demon-possessed and crippled and blind and sick. Enemies and came and tried to trap Jesus, but this man was none of that. He was well-respected, he was well-connected, he was well-to-do, but he had a question. And I'm going to call this a great question. This is an amazing question. He says, teacher. So he comes to him with a, a respect. Some of the other gospels say, good teacher. He says, I have a question. What good thing can I do that I may obtain eternal life? So this idea of good, and Jesus sees us that recognizing that in, in the mind of this young man that Jesus was, had a position of respect. He was good. And he's asking a good question. And in Mark and Luke, it says it this way, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I think Jesus is hitting there that I appreciate that you call me good, but understand that's not quite far enough, Right? Only God is good. So if you're calling me good, you need to understand my connection with the divine. And he's dropping some subtle hints here. But I call this a great question because it's a question about eternal life. That's an important issue, is it not? It's a good question. It's a great question to ask. Now, again, this man is most likely, and I would say he's Jewish, and so you can understand from a Jewish or from Judaism, 
He's understood there's something beyond this life. So a couple of phrases I learned, olam hazeth, means this present physical world. And olam haba, it means the world to come. Those were phrases that would be used in Judaism that they would teach people. There is this present life, but then there is this life to come. And this man was concerned about the life to come, which I would suggest would be rare for him, right? Because... Why would you think about the life to come when your life is really good now? What's he concerned about? He's concerned about eternal life. We need to understand really what he was thinking about. Eternal life, biblically, is not just about length of life, not just about something that goes on and on, but also about qualities of that life. Eternal life, biblically, is not just about quantity, but even more so about quality. And we're going to see that in some other passages in just a moment. But let me tell you a story that illustrates that point. I've never told you a story from Greek mythology. This is a first. You ready? There's a story told of, a, of Aurora. She was a Greek goddess, the goddess of dawn. And as the story goes, Aurora fell in love with a mortal youth named Dathonus. Now, it's not good for a goddess to fall in love with a mortal youth. Why? Because goddesses live forever, but mortal youth are what? Mortal. You get the problem here? That's going to be a problem. So Aurora, as the story goes, as the legend goes, she went to Zeus, and she said, Zeus, can you make Tithonus, this one I love, live forever? Never die. He said, sure. But she made a mistake. She didn't include in her request that this Tithonus might be young forever. That's a big mistake. Because Zeus granted her request. So according to this legend, he did live forever. But he got older and older and older. And more frail and frail and frail. Until eternal life became more of a curse than a blessing. This great man asked a great question about eternal life. But to understand eternal life biblically, we need to understand it's not just about how do I live forever, but how do I live forever in the right way? How do I live forever in a right relationship with God? Now let me show you some other passages. First Timothy chapter 6 says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of what? Eternal life. When do you take hold of it? Now. Take hold of eternal life now. Be rightly related to God now. And then that goes on forever and frankly gets better forever. 1 John chapter 5 says it this way, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son Jesus Christ, this is the true God and what? Eternal life. This eternal life is in Jesus because it's through Jesus that we can be rightly related with God our creator and then live eternally in that right relationship. So we see this great man with this great question about how do I live in rightly relationship with God forever? That's really what he's getting at. But this great man with this great question has a massive misunderstanding. And it becomes very clear. He says, teacher, what good things shall I do to have this right relationship with God and have it forever? You see the misunderstanding? It's a very common misunderstanding. It's a great misunderstanding. But he would... You would understand why he would think this because his whole life had been full of success. He'd, he'd achieved wealth. 
and property and possessions. He'd, he'd gained status in his culture, all in a very short period of time. So it would make sense. So now what do I need to do? I've achieved all of this. Now I need to achieve a bit more. What good thing shall I do? There's a misunderstanding there. Now some people say, well, the Old Testament that he was probably more used to was all about doing good things. It was about good works. And the New Testament, when Jesus comes now, it's about grace. I just say that's a wrong way of thinking about that. That is absolutely wrong. Never in the Old Testament did anybody come into a right relationship with God through their good works. Never. And so we can go all the way back to Abraham, who was the, the forefather of what we call faith. Look how it's talked about in the book of Romans, referring to Abraham. What shall we say about Abraham, our forefather? If, in fact, Abraham was justified, or if Abraham came into a right relationship with God by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Read it with me. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what Abraham did that brought him to a right relationship with God. He simply believed God. He believed what God said. He believed what God provided. It goes on to say, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift. You go to work, and you get your paycheck. Is that a gift? No, it's what you deserve. You've worked for that, and you'll be upset if you don't get it, won't you? It's not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, read it with me, his faith is credited as righteousness. So even Abraham didn't work himself up to a good relationship with God. He simply believed what God told him by faith. And there was this right relationship that developed that Abraham is experiencing even today. So if you work for it, it's not a gift. If you work for it, you earned it, you deserve it. Now look what the New Testament says in Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the what? Gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word gift, it, it's where we get the word grace, favor, unmerited favor. So this gift is available because of Jesus. He took our place, took our punishment, took our sin, so that he could then extend to us as we believe him, as we trust him, as we put our faith in him, he can give us that gift of eternal life. Now it's interesting this rich young ruler is not the only one that asked about what they could do. It was kind of a common way to think in, 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 in the religion of the day. We need to do these things. Let me show you another text. They said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? What should we do to do all the right things that God expects of us? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. What is it? Believe in me. Believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, believe in me. That's it. If you want to call that a work, I guess you can, but it's simply belief. So you see this misunderstanding that this great man has. It was prevalent in the day, and I would say it's still prevalent today, is it not? People wanting to do something to be in right relationship with God. I would say every religion in the world is a result of this misunderstanding. People are always trying to create a new religion. There might be some of us here today still with this misunderstanding. I'm here today to do something good so that I can be in a right relationship with God. I'm say, I'm, you're failing, all right? That's not how it works. Yeah, sadly, this misunderstanding floats through the church sometimes as a noxious gas that we just kind of keep breathing it and we need to get rid of it because that noxious gas just produces a pride in us that somehow we're doing something good 
to earn a standing with God. So the great man had a great question about eternal life, but he had a great misunderstanding. Now I want you to notice Jesus answered, it's an odd answer. He says there's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, do what? Keep the commandments. Now, somebody's saying, I thought you just said we couldn't do it. So where's Jesus going here? Jesus is leading this man very beautifully so he can understand this truth that it's not about what you do. Some of you would say, Jesus, you missed your chance. Here's a man that wants to know how to have eternal life, so you need to lead him in the sinner's prayer. But that's a problem. He didn't think he was a sinner. <laughs> Somebody that doesn't think they're a sinner can't pray the sinner's prayer, whatever that prayer is. We need to watch this because Jesus so beautifully leads this man to this clear understanding of faith in him and him alone. So he's, the, the, Jesus says, keep the commandments, and the young man says, which ones? And it's interesting what Jesus does. He, you know, there are ten commandments. Can you all name them right now? Probably not. So let me help you out. Let me put them up on the screen, okay? There's the ten commandments, and the ones in yellow, those are the ones that Jesus mentioned. And then he adds on at the end, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, all right? It's interesting what Jesus does. You look at the first four, they're more directed towards God, commands towards God. And then these other ones that Jesus mentions are more relational issues. Now, it's, and it's interesting the way he put them in order. He didn't say it in that order. He actually ended with honor your father and your mother. Jesus says, keep these horizontal commands. He doesn't mention the vertical ones at all. Does anybody want to know why? I would love to talk to Jesus about that one. And why didn't he just say, just believe in me, and that's enough? Well, the reason I believe Jesus gave this answer is because the question that the man asked was very specific. He said, what must I do to obtain eternal life. And Jesus is saying, well, if it's up to you doing something, you need to keep these commandments. Not just for a day, not just for a moment, but 24-7. Not just moving forward from now, but your whole life, you will have to kept these commandments. This great man, he'd done a lot of things in his life, and now he wants to know what he has to do to gain eternal life, and Jesus says, keep the law. Here's a problem. Jesus knows, and he's trying to get this young man to recognize that the law was not given to gain eternal life. This man needs to know that God's law is good, it's beneficial, that it's even eternal, that it comes from God but the point of it was not that if you do all of this, you can have eternal life because God knows what? We can't do it. It's a perfect standard. It's a high standard. No one can attain to it. I'm going to overwhelm you with some other New Testament passages. This is so critical, church. Galatians chapter 3 says this, Is the law contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which would be able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on what? The law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who what? Believe. It's like the law has, has shown all of us we have a problem because we can't do it as much as we try however great we think we are. And this was spoken to some people within the church that were saying, Jesus is really good, but you still have to keep all the law. Talk about frustration. It's impossible to do. And if you could do it, then why did Jesus come? It would be pointless. So the law shows clearly our sin, our inadequacies, and it's meant to lead us to Christ. Another passage in Romans, look at this. For what the law could not do, 
weak as it was through the flesh. In other words, the law given, as perfect as it was, could not accomplish eternal life because of the weakness of humanity to be able to keep it. So what did God do? It's beautiful, isn't it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled where? In us. In us. God would be able to look at us and say, you've done it perfectly through Jesus Christ because of our faith in him. That's good news, amen? That's really good news. It's a good law. The Ten Commandments are good, but they're weak in our flesh. The requirement is met by Jesus. See, this is where Jesus is leading this man. Let's go on a little bit more here in verse 20. The young man said to him, this is another interesting answer, all these things I have kept. And the other gospels say, all these things I have kept from my youth. Man, how does he get off saying that? Would you say that? So I think he says that again because he's thinking strictly of external religion and he's thinking of generalities. I've kind of generally kept these things since I was a kid. But he's not thinking about specifics and he's certainly not thinking about his heart, which is where Jesus is leading the conversation to his heart. And it's interesting, Jesus doesn't correct him and says, no, you haven't. He says, all right, I'll go with that. Let's just go down this road a little bit more. Mark adds an amazing statement in here is that Jesus felt a love for him. Here's a young man with a great question, and he comes, what do I need to do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commands. And he says, I've done all of that. And Jesus said, I love this guy. He's way off. <laughs> he's, he's not getting it, but I love this guy. And I want you to notice in that boast, there's also a desperate need. Here's what he's saying. I've kept the rules, but something is still lacking. I've been good for a really long time, but something is still lacking. I was raised in a really good home, but something is still lacking. I have all these things around me, but something is still lacking. I can do lots of good things, but something is still lacking. I have great responsibility, but he says, I'm still missing something. This was a great man. He had a great life, but in the end, he knew it wasn't quite enough. Again, we look at one of the other Gospels in verse in, in the book of Mark, it says this young man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him because he was really desperate. With all that he had, he was still desperate because he recognized that everything that he was doing and everything that he had still wasn't enough for this thing that he knew was out there. I want to show you a quote from a man named Blaise Pascal. He was an intelligent man and just, just captured it so well. It says, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help that he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help since this infinite abyss can only be filled with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. What well, That is so well said. There's this infinite abyss that only God can fill that we can try and try and try to fill it with everything else and have these great pursuits and achieve them, but something will still be lacking. So this great man asked a great question which revealed a great misunderstanding that led to Jesus' great answer which revealed his great need. But then Jesus in this discussion puts him in a huge dilemma. This amazing dilemma. Jesus said to him, okay, if you want to be complete, 
Go sell your possessions and give it away. And then you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and do what? Follow me. Yeah, you have a sense you're still lacking. So Jesus didn't say, okay, it'll be all right. He says, now you think you're keeping the whole law. Now with all your stuff, you need to sell it all and give it to the poor. Why is he saying this? Again, because he's, he's working this man to see his need, his heart need. Jesus sees his heart. Jesus sees that everything that he has is entrenched in his heart. Jesus sees that he's in bondage at the heart level to all of this stuff. What Jesus is doing, he's showing him that you're really breaking the very most important of the commandments, very beginning. Let me show you that commandment again. He's saying, you've broken these, right? You do have other gods before me. You do have other idols, and you need to get rid of that. You need to look to me and follow me, and he had many gods, many idols in his life. He's exposing his heart. He's directing the man to consider his heart. He's wanting to see you've loved all this stuff, but you need to love me. Church, this is a place where every man, woman, and child needs to come. We recognize we need desperately Jesus, and everything else pales in comparison to that. This last phrase a man uh, that, that, that scripture gives us is actually heart-wrenching. Verse 22, when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving. Why? Because he owned much property. He went away grieving. It's like I recognize my bondage and it's too much. It's too strong. That's an interesting conversation that Jesus has with this great man. Pointing him to his heart issue, his love of possession. So after talking with this young man, he turns to the disciples and said, I want to talk with you just a little bit. And then he gives this amazing illustration. He says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's actually easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. What do you think everybody was thinking? That is a crazy illustration. Now, some try to soften it. They try to soften it to say that word for camel could actually be translated rope because the Greek words are very similar. But that doesn't work either because now you need to get a rope through the eye of the needle. Some say that that eye of the needle is actually a reference to a, it's the name of a gate that's very small. So for a camel to go through there, they'd have to unload all of their stuff and go through actually on their knees. And that's really a powerful image. But I've done as much research as I can in that. You can't back that up anywhere. It's like a cool story, but it doesn't fit. What Jesus is doing here is what he often does. He's using exaggeration. Because later in Matthew, he says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a what? You swallow a camel. He said earlier, you need to take the log out of your eye. He's using these huge exaggerations to drive home his point. But what's the point? What's this huge exaggeration driving us to understand? It's this, church. It's driving this man to understand that it's impossible for you to be saved. It's impossible for anybody to be saved unless God does that work. On your own, it is useless. See, when the Jewish people heard this, and when the disciple says, well, if it's like that way for this man, then who can be saved? Because in that culture, if you were rich and wealthy and had lots of stuff, it means you were blessed by God. And so they're saying, if this person who's obviously blessed by God can't be saved, then nobody can be saved. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. Unless I work, unless God works in a heart, nobody can be saved. Without God, salvation is impossible. Amen? Do you agree with that? 
Unless God works, we're all doomed. It is the work of God. It's never a work of man. It's the plan of God. It's not our plan. We would have never thought of it. It is by God's grace and not human effort. It is by faith and it's never by works. Church, it was impossible for me to be saved unless God had done something in my heart. And that's true for you today. If you're saved, it's because God worked. Amen? You didn't come up with it. I don't know who Brad Gray is, but I'm going to steal his quote. Here it is. The salvation of wretched sinners by an omni-holy and forever righteous God is by all accounts a categorical, categorical impossibility. The logic of righteousness insists as much not permitting even the smallest ounce of sin to blemish the remarkable majesty of the Lord's perfection. It's a categorical impossibility for anybody to be saved in right relationship with God unless God initiates that. That's what Jesus is driving us to understand. All right, so what do we do with all this? There's one minor and one major application I'd like to leave you with. First, minor. This is the minor application. We each need to evaluate our relationship with money and possessions because they can easily be idols in our culture, amen, because the economy is everything. We hear that over and over again. The economy is good. We're making more money. We're doing all of this, so everything is good. We need to be aware of three things, relationship to money and possessions. Number one, riches or money foster a very false independence. In other words, when we think we have ourselves covered, even financially, we tend to be independent of God. So there's this phrase in the Lord's Prayer that says this, give us this day our what? Really? We're supposed to live day by day by day trusting him? No, but I have to have my bank account. And if I have my bank account, I don't have to pray that prayer, right? And of course, I have my credit cards. It's easy for us to become lukewarm when we have stuff. That's just the fact of the matter. In the book of uh, Revelation, there's this message to the church at Laodicea that says, you're lukewarm, and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's the same church that Jesus says, you say, I'm rich, and I've become wealthy, and I don't have need of anything. I see a connection there. We oftentimes become lukewarm spiritually because we have all this stuff that just kind of artificially softens everything. We need to evaluate and understand that riches or wealth sometimes bind us to things that are physical and keep us from those things that are spiritual. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your what is? your heart. So when we have a bunch of stuff, it's so easy to get grounded on our stuff. The more we have, it's interesting, the more we think about what we have. The more we have, the more we have to take care of what we have. The more we have, the more we seem to want. Isn't it interesting how as these wealth, the wealth increases, we just think about it more and more. How much is enough? A little bit more. John D. Rockefeller lived in the early 1900s. He today would be considered the most wealthiest man in the world. He would, he would have more than uh, the Amazon guy. Who's that? Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos and the uh, Bill Gates guy. They, they, if you put those two together, they're still not as wealthy as Rockefeller was. And so he was asked one time, how much money is enough? And he responded, just a little bit more. Isn't that amazing? We, when we believe that we're going to be happier because we have more, it's just a lie. But many of us buy it. Another thing we need to evaluate in our relationship with money and possessions that Money and possessions tend to make us selfish. Now that's odd, isn't it? 
You would think the more we have, the more we would give, but just the opposite happens. And that's been proven at the very secular level, having nothing to do with the Bible. The more people have, the less generous they become. I love that story of Zacchaeus, you know, that very wealthy man who was a bit vertically challenged. He climbed up in the tree to see Jesus, and as soon as he saw Jesus for what he was and who he was, the first thing Zacchaeus says, half of my possessions I'm going to give away. Wow. His whole attitude towards money changed when he saw Jesus for who he really was. His attitude toward money changed when he recognized the glory of Jesus. I hope that's continuing to happen in our life. The more we see about Jesus, the more, the more loosely we hold on to all this stuff that we have. There's that song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, then what happens? The things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. So we need to evaluate, church, our relationship with money and possessions. That's what Jesus was driving this man to do. Think about how these things have a hold on you. But it's hard for us to evaluate that. We live in the most wealthy nation in the world. It's all around us. How do we evaluate if we're doing this well? That's hard. Maybe the best way to evaluate it is to look not how much we have, Maybe we need to ask, how much are we willing to give? Because isn't that where Jesus took this young man? So give it away, and we'll see if it has a hold on you. Give it away, and we'll see if you're in bondage. Somebody once said, the way to keep money and possession from being an idol is to give it away. That works, right? The remedy for getting is really giving. How can I give what it is that I've been given? I believe every time we give generously to others or, or to God or to ministry, I think it loosens the grip that that stuff has on us. Yes, we can look at what we have to evaluate it, but let me just say this. Look at your last year. What did you give? Without wanting anything in return, what did you just give? That's the best evaluation. Because if you can just give it, it doesn't own you, amen? But if you can't give it, it does own you. So that was the, main, the minor application. Here's the major application. We need to rejoice in our relationship with God. We need to understand that it all is because of him. Because if it's up to us, we're doomed. But it's not up to us, amen? Jesus won our salvation. Because understand, if we earned it, then we have to keep it. If it was up to our good works to earn it, we have to keep doing those good works. And that is just grueling, church. I want to encourage you today just to rejoice in this impossible salvation that you have. Because God did it for you. He won you, he sought you, he saved you, he sacrificed for you so that you can have this relationship with him as you sincerely put your trust in him. Rejoice in your relationship with God. This is a great story. It's a familiar story. I've been praying all week that I would understand how this applies to me. And I included you in that as well, okay? Okay that you would understand how that applies to you. Some of us here may be in deep bondage to money and possession. But you say, I don't have very much. That doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter how much you have. It's your attitude towards it. If all you can think about is I need a little bit more to be happy, and if I got just a little bit more, I'd be satisfied, it's a lie. That won't make you happy, and you won't be satisfied because your sights are on the wrong thing. Focus on Jesus. Understand what he's done for you, and then be free to live in this very plenteous, 
land for his glory. Well, we need to pray. We'll invite our brothers and sisters back up to lead us in worship. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you. And um, we thank you that you provided all that you provide for us. Lord, even in this land of plenty, we just say thank you for that because you're good. And we enjoy your goodness in that way. But, Lord, I confess, um, sometimes that little bit more seems to be the pursuit. As opposed to seeking your kingdom first. And then allowing you to take care of everything else. Lord, we want to be a church. We want to be a people that is all out for you. Investing in those things that are eternal. So, Lord, bring us a little bit more towards that. So, Jesus, you can be made much of in every aspect of our life. So, Lord, even as we sing, Lord, we do surrender. I surrender again, Lord, the things that I have, the the concerns I have, the worries I have, Lord, we surrender to you.